I would like to introduce uh, how we got to this point. This is our third year of Home Book Lindsay County, and uh, we're joined by Kent Myers, our author of Witness of Combines. This year's selection was chosen because it speaks to so many of us. Whether you grew up on a farm or not, you most likely have similar stories to those found in the collection of essays. Helping out with farm or house chores, getting stuck in a snowdrift, and hopefully not tonight, or being chased away by your cousin's farm dog, and that's me. We can all see our own ex experiences in these stories. But these essays also speak to us because we call the prairie our home. Rural communities have a connection to the land like no other. We schedule our lives around its seasons. We measure its vast distance through lines that converge at the end of the road. It is the connection between our community and the next. The prairie has had a tremendous impact on our sense of place. Tonight's honored guest asks us to consider these ideas in Witness of Combines. Ken Myers is the author of a memoir, a book of short fiction, and three novels, most recently Twisted Tree, which won a Society of Midland Authors Award and a High Plains Book Award and was translated into French. The River Warren and the Light of the Cross in the Crossing were New York Times notable books, and the work of Wolves won the Mountain and Plains Booksellers Association Award and an American Library Association Award. He lives in Spearfish, South Dakota, and teaches in Pacific Lutheran University's Low Residency MFA program. Our host for tonight's events is Amy Jurens. Amy has been a full-time English faculty at NCC for 20 years. She teaches composition, literature, creative writing, and public speaking, and she has taught a Midwest literature course at NCC, where she assigned Kent Meyer's book, The River Warren, which she highly recommends. She's honored to be able to sit down with him tonight and discuss the witness of combines. Please join me in welcoming Kent Myers and Amy Jurens. Well, thank you all for coming out. I know this weather is not fun, and I, I'm disappointed. I, I was hoping the, the snow would hold off so we could get a better turnout tonight. We've traveled so far to be here with us, but thank you so much. Okay, I'm sorry, Wendell. Come back in the morning. He's, he's visiting us at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, so <laughs> tell your friends. <laughs> so looking at the collection, uh, what motivated you to write it? Was it about reflecting on your life? Uh, was it written as a remembrance, or did you have some other audience and purpose in mind? None of those things. Um, <laughs> you know, writing it kind of takes shape out of writing. and. I told the story this morning to, to the group of students. Um, in many ways, this book came accidentally. Uh, I really see myself as a fiction writer, and that is what I really work at, concentrate on. But every once in a while, I'll get an idea for an essay. And it'll come from wherever, and I will write this essay. And so I maybe write one or two essays a year. Um, and over the course of a few years, I had about 15 essays that um, I had put together as a book, even though they weren't. You know, they were just a bunch of scattered essays, but I, I was at a point in my writing career where I really wanted to publish. I hadn't published a book. And so I put these 15 essays together in a, and claimed they were a book, you know, if I just claim they're a book, some editor will be dumb enough to think they're a book, <laughs> um, and sent them out, and luckily I sent them to the University of Minnesota Press, and the editor there, Todd Oriola, uh, read them, and called me up and said, um, yeah, this really isn't a book, <laughs> but he said, you've got half of those essays, uh, there were seven or eight of them, he said, they are centered on this town. This, this loss of my father, the death of my father and the community's response to it. Um, some of the essays were totally disparate, totally different things. There was this core. And he said, if you can um, take those seven or eight essays and keep them, and then write enough more to give me a 220-page book, it was very specific, a 220-page book, he said, I think I can publish this. Um, and so I said, okay, I'll do that. I, on the phone, I'll do that. I hung up the phone and just went, oh my God, how am I going to do this? I had no idea um, how I was going to do that. But um, the impetus, obviously, to answer the question, to write the book, was that it had been, it had been accepted. 
you know, for publication. And now I had to write it. Um, and I wanted to write it. I, I really, um, you know, believe that what I'm doing with this book is important. As I was shaping it up, I, I believed in it. But really, the, the initial emphasis is just I wanted to be published. And I um, accidentally almost <laughs> stumbled into a way to do it and then had to write the book to fulfill it. I like that. <laughs> so now you're a resident of the Black Hills. Geography is quite different from mm -hmm. southern Minnesota and northwest mm -hmm. Iowa, of course. How does that landscape affect you, and what do you miss about the plains? Yeah, I think mountains and um, prairie are very different um, psychologically, uh, and I, might, I think I even somewhere in this book I think I, I address that. But um, if you grow up in the plains, I, I think that you have an innate sense of artistic perspective, <laughs> three-point perspective. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's just almost natural to somebody living on the plains because you, you every every summer, you see those cornrows, you know, just receding down to a, a, a point. You see the railroad tracks um, on that flat land going down to infinity. And um, I think I think that uh, you know, perspective was something that I I'm not an artist, but I never had any trouble understanding. It just made perfect sense to me. Um, and I suspect it does to most of you who grew up on the plains. You know, you've got a, you've got a bowl, and you've got a surface, and then you've got things disappearing into that. Um, I think that the the plains, um, you know, and Scott Mamaday has this beautiful essay called The Way to Rainy Mountain, where he kind of addresses this. He says, you know, the, the sun dance is a dance of the plains. Um, that the Kiowa Indians it didn't have a sun dance until they came came into the plains. And, and that is a deity of the plains because it's, you feel it, don't you? I mean, you know, you can't hide on the plains. I mean, God's up there, he's watching. And you better behave. Uh, I think it's psychologically um, true. In, in mountains, on the other hand, there's always a sense of, I think, of, of mystery, of um, every corner, you don't know what's around it. So every draw, every uh, the landscape's broken. It, it changes as you move through it in a way that, that the prairie doesn't. And so I just think psychically, that psychically they're very, they're very different. Um, I like mountains. I, I will say, I uh, as a child, I always dreamed of <laughs> going to mountains, and I spent as much time as I could once I was able to travel. Uh, either ride my sickle or um, take a car. I go to the Minnesota River Valley um, because I just I just yearn for I don't know to be hidden <laughs> maybe <laughs> to not have that sky watching me. On the other hand, I think as I say in this book, surprises in the, the flames come from the sky, and, and when they come, they can be really uh, really powerful. And those are those are the tornadic winds and the thunderstorms. Um, I'll tell a little story. Why do you want me to go on with this? Uh, I, I was putting gas about five years ago. I was putting gas in my car um, in um, a town in South Dakota. I forget where it was. Kadoka, Kadoka, South Dakota. And I'm under a shelter. I'm under, under the shelter. And I'm putting gas in the car. And I, I see this storm coming. And I, I've been living in the, in the mountains too long. It's coming all the way out. The storm's coming. I'm putting gas. And that storm people came, it was so fast that by the time I realized, like, oh, jeez, I got to do something about this, I got wet. I was on the wrong side of the car to get into it. I was in this, you know, I had to go kind of past that outside the shelter just a little bit. I was soaked by the time I got that car to work. And we're talking about seconds. And I got in the car and I, thought, I just thought to myself, yep, been in the mountains too long. <laughs> you know, I've, I've forgotten what the plains are like and what the sky can do out here. So. In the book, you share many stories about your brothers. They mm -hmm. played a prominent role and their impact on your life definitely is notable. Uh, we're curious about the, your sisters and your relationship with your sisters. 
that wasn't as pronounced in the book. Can you talk well, about that? And that's just because I don't know what farm life is like now, but it was really gender stratified when I grew up. I mean, um, the the reason I talk about my brothers more is not because I love my sisters any less, but the working relationship I had was was with my brothers. Um, I mean, we were the ones who went out and did all the outdoors work, and my sisters did all the indoors work, and that's just the way it was. Um, you know, I, I tried um, to bring some of the female side of that experience into the essays, you know, by talking about my mother's canning and, uh, you know, my grandmother's roses, um, elderberry picking. Um, but but the, the simple truth is that um, the, 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 the deep working relationships were with my brothers. Um, I get along really well with my sisters <laughs> uh, as an adult. I just had less to do with them as I was growing up and I did my brothers. Uh, and less to write about, you know. So you show your parents a great deal of respect without being over sentimental. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And at times you share their guidelines for living. Mm -hmm. Did you use those same philosophies when you were raising your family? Yeah, I pretty much did. Um, you know, I really, I think, I think along those lines, one of the things I say in this book that I really tried to make part of the way I raised my children was to, to not let them think their lives were more important than my and my wives. You know, it was really, for me, it was, I say in the book that, you know, I had to learn my father's life. He didn't learn mine. And... Uh, I think there's a great deal to be said, by the way, for, for parents learning their, their children's lives and, and, and encouraging their children's lives. But I think if, I think if, you, if you do too much of that, uh, kids kind of don't know, well, where am I going? You know, if, if nothing is, if my whole life is a soccer game, well, then where do I go? And so I really did try to make my kids aware that, that my life was important and what I did was important. And um, there were just times that it was more important than their lives. So, so making that balance, um, I think it's really hard for modern parents. I think it's really hard for modern parents because there's so little opportunity in the contemporary world for, for kids to naturally join in the activities of parents. For farm kids, it's just a natural thing. You know, you, you got to go feed the chickens because the chickens need feeding, and dad can't do it, so you're really participating in your father's life, or you're, you, you got to help, help with canning or participate in your mother's life. That's harder, I think, now um, for, for parents to do, but I think it's an important thing to do. So, so yeah, in many ways, I did really try to sustain some of that, some of that philosophical stuff. Yeah, yeah. They didn't let you choose what you were going to be involved with, and you were involved with what they did. Right, right. I, I, we were, I, I was involved in my, you know, my dad did not play baseball with me. You know, that just wasn't something he did. He was working. And if I wanted to do something with him, well, then I was doing it on his ground, <laughs> usually. Although he was a very loving father. I mean, I, you know, it's an interesting thing to, it can sound like he was aloof and distant, but that's not it at all. It's, it's a, the, it's the direction in which you connect it, that I'm talking about. So this year marks the 20th anniversary since the publication of your book. That's amazing. Yeah. I didn't know that long. <laughs> wow. But we're curious, when's the last time you've been back home where you grew up? And uh, do you have any insights? or? Perspective? Well, you know, I was just talking about that with uh, Joe. Yeah. Um, my mother died. Um, four years ago, um, and she had lived in Morgan, this small town, all of her life, but when she died, you know, I really lost the connection, the whole family did, and, um, and there's really no reason to go back to Morgan, Minnesota for me anymore. And that was something of a surprise. I mean, we had kind of prepared for my mother's death, but what we hadn't really prepared for was 
everything that gets lost along with that. And um, because small towns, rural towns are, are really dying, they just, I mean, Morgan had 952 people when I was growing up, but it's maybe got 600 now, if it's lucky, and it has nothing. I mean, when I was growing up, it had two clothing stores and three grocery stores and a, two hardware stores, um, an implement dealership, you know, a car dealership. I mean, it was, it was a thriving little town of a thousand people. It's got nothing anymore. And um, so the my physical contact with that town, once my mother died, there's just plain no reason to, to go back to Morgan. So I went back there for, you know, since her funeral. Um, I've got a sister living fairly close who I will eventually visit, I'm sure. Um, but that's a really interesting sort of disconnection. I, I, I won't call it grief, but it's, a, it's this thing that's now gone. From my, it's all, it's in my memory now. It's not, not in, in a physical reality anymore. Really. Kind of funny. For me, I live in my grandparents' house, and my dad lives in his grandparents' house, though it's not in the country, <laughs> it's a rated town. And uh, so I, I still have that connection. Right, absolutely. And, and yeah. it's just, I don't, it would be strange to not have it, so. Yeah, it is, it is a little strange. Yeah, this was your, this was your childhood, and, and where you, where you roamed, you know, and my and the farmstead, you know, at the end of this book of essays, I, I write a, a essay called Going Back, where I, I run from Morgan four miles out. I was a runner then, and I couldn't do that anymore, uh, and describe the place, but it's gone now. I mean, it's literally, as a place, it is gone. It's been plowed up, you know, and that's a weird sensation to go, to go down a road that you have mapped in your memory and you know what you're going to get to and then it's just plain not there it it disconcerts you as to what your to what place means what does place mean it's still the same gps coordinates but that's not what place is is it you know, place is something much different than that and so as a place it's gone so it's funny Another uh, change that is marked in the book, and one that really impacted me, was Birds Against the Glass, mm -hmm. um, and how the killing of the chickens when you had to do it. Yeah. That that marked a change in your relationship with animals, and um, like in River Warren, uh, what stood out to me was you know the cattle, and, mm -hmm. and you know when they were in the truck and oh, yeah, all of yeah, that, yeah. And, um, and the importance of them to the Gruber family. And mm -hmm. so, can you talk a little bit about? animals in your life and did you consciously make them prominent in the book or is it just because they, well, they were just prominent are in if you grow up on a farm animals are just the substrate of your existence they're they're not i'm not very sentimental about animals um i don't i don't currently have a pet in the house um i loved animals when i was growing up but you know i'm a little bit i think like my like my mother was when she got rid of her canning jars like i've done enough of that <laughs> you know i just don't really need to deal with cat poop anymore <laughs> you know i shoveled loads of it <laughs> growing up with pitchforks you know i i walked around it and i i mean i manure was just just, I hate to say it, but it was just kind of the, what I lived in. <laughs> and so um, I think that animals are very powerful, but I'm just not very sentimental about them. I mean, they're mess. <laughs> and they're just playing an awful lot of work. And, and uh, I mean, when you're really intimate with them in the way I was, where they're, where, they're, they're, they're the way you make your living. I mean, they're, they're professional in that sense, as opposed to amateurs, you know. And so um, you can't write about farm life as I knew it without writing about animals. And I don't think you can, 
you, I don't think it has, as a person, I, I don't maybe even recognize how deeply embedded that experience is in me. But it just comes out in writing. Right? It's not a conscious thing at all. It's just that's what was there. Right about what you know. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the land and its and the importance of place is definitely prominent in the book. Uh, what is our relationship to the land like today with changing technology, environmental concerns, chemicals? Um, that's a that's of course you know you know that's a huge question. Um, even when I was. 18 years old, the the pressure to get big was very strong, um, and I think that most farms probably now are two to three times as big as. I mean, that was a 200 acre farm. A farmer couldn't exist on 200 acres. Certainly not raising nine children anymore. I mean, you'd need at least 600 acres, wouldn't you? At least the sections, I think, now. Isn't that pretty more typical that a farm would be out here? I don't know, but I've been gone from it too far, too long. But, you know, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And as they get bigger, of course, the towns get smaller and smaller and smaller. So, so you've got a, a community issue going on with that. Um, the reason Morgan doesn't have, you know, two clothing stores and you know, three grocery stores anymore is because there just aren't enough people in the surrounding community to support that sort of thing. And so you get a, a diminishment of community. And of course, um, you also get, as, as technology replaces manual labor, in the form of herbicides, for instance, um, in the form of um, immense baling machines that don't require manual labor, you, you lose the connection between the, the farm community and the, the city community, the, the, the town community. Um, there was definitely a, a division when I was growing up. I mean, we were farm kids, and then there were the town kids. We, we recognized that difference. But there was this um, interplay between those two, because a lot of the town kids got jobs walking beans or baling hay for the farmers. Um, and, and so I think communities were more tightly bound then than they are now by, for, for all sorts of reasons like that. There was this interplay. When farmers now direct their dependence away from their community into agribusiness, you know, into Dow Chemical, <laughs> for instance, I think it changes the nature of um, their work and of course their relationship to their, to their local communities in all sorts of, in all sorts of ways which frankly i i probably have been gone from this kind of community too long to, to say much more than very abstract things like that about it um, but i really am interested in the ways that work and community and relationships bind people together so when the work changes, I think those other things change also. Yeah. Do you see other threads that join us together now that the land and the work maybe doesn't join us as much? Do you see any other common threads? Well, Facebook, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, <laughs> um, I suspect Facebook really is an attempt to, to replace things that are more naturally done. Um, Obviously, this does. I mean, you know, I've been engaged in talking to people about libraries for, for a day now. And so I think that uh, knowledge does, and I think that um, education does. Certainly, media does. I mean, people talk about television shows, you know. Um, if any of you have watched The Man in the High Castle, you know, you and I are friends. <laughs> because we have something to, to talk about, you know, that we're both interested in. Um, <laughs> I don't know that one. I can't stand you. <laughs> I mean, so there are, there always are going to be attempts. I mean, it's just an innate thing in, in human beings to want to be connected. 
so, so there will be attempts to make that happen. Whether or not they're as powerful as the ones that are, that are coming out of work, I don't know. I mean, part of, part of what I write in this book, I think, throughout the whole thing, is this idea that work binds you together in ways you don't even know. You, know, you breathe the same way when you're working together. Sports do it. Also, I suspect, I think sports are a, a substitute for work in a lot of ways. And basketball so. definitely binds people in North Carolina. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's huge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what is one of your favorite essays from the book at this point in your life? You know, I, I do like my mother's silence. I just like that essay. I think that's one of the, that's just one of my favorites. My students just talked about that one yesterday oh, did they? Okay. in class, my creative writing class. And uh, I had them think about the culture of their families. And okay. are there things that they remember from being a child that they didn't like or dreaded? Mm -hmm. And maybe now that they have a different perspective on, are there other things besides the canning that maybe you have a different perspective on now? about the culture of your family? That you mourn, maybe? Mm -hmm. Can't cope with anything. I'm sorry, that one I can't, I can't come up with that one. <laughs> you stumped me, yeah, stumped me on that one. No. So certainly you left out some stories, some things didn't make it into the book. Um, are there any that you'd like to share with us that did make it? I was a boomerang maker. And I, I have written actually other essays about that. They're not in the book, but one of the things I did as a child was, and I think it's one of the sources of my uh, of invention for me is we had these. We had a wood pile in the corner of the room. We had an iron pile in the corner of the room. Just scrap stuff, you know, the stuff was thrown in there. And for me, that was just raw material. For I, mean, I made, I made, I don't know how many boomerangs. I'm a pretty good boomerang maker. <laughs> um, crossbows, you know, spears out of strap iron, atlatls to throw them with. It was all weapons, by the way. But, but I spent hours and hours and hours learning to use tools. You know, I just started to use a tool. I learned to use a tool by using it, you know. Grinders scared the hell out of me until I used one, you know, those sparks. And then one day I just had to use that grinder, and so I overcame my fear and because I was making a crossbow out of a, out of a steel leaf spray, and you had to, had to grind it down. Um, and, and so, um, in, in doing that, I learned to use tools, I learned to make things, I learned to, to not care about failure. I, I bet I made a dozen boomerangs before I made one that didn't break, you know. It's just like, oh well, go back to the shed and make another one. And, I mean, I am read, actually, I'm answering your other question about culture, I think, now, that that became, I think, one of the reasons I can draft a novel and then start over and retype the whole thing and then do it again and then do it again over the course of five years because that's how I made boomerangs. You know, I learned, I learned that's how you make stuff. You just keep make until the damn thing comes back. And then you've learned how to make one, you know. So um, it was a big part of my life doing that sort of thing. Yeah, it seems like now we have to find ways to teach our children to fail. <laughs> and you know, it was yeah. just your everyday. It's just part of just part of life. And I never, I never thought of it as as a lesson in not failing until recently. And, but I think that's what it is. No one's telling me how, how to do it, or, or isn't, no one has even gave me a vision of what it meant to make a good boomerang. I had to invent that idea. I mean, in my view, it was if it, got, if it came back to me without breaking. <laughs> two, two things, you know. And, uh, but, but there was no one teaching me how to do it. There was no one else doing it better than I was that I had to get jealous of and compare myself to. So. All of that, I think, is really, really important training to creative making. Yeah. 
Do any of you have questions for Ken? Please ask. I'm just staying here, so I'll, I'll take them. I'd be happy to have them. <laughs> um, before your dad died, did you have a sense at that time of like whether you wanted to be back on the or I you? did. <clears throat> I never wanted to be a farmer. My older brother did and my um one of my younger brothers wanted to farm. Um I, I went into FFA because that's what I did, and that's what people did. Um, and in fact, I was president of the FFA organization at my high school. Um, but I always knew I wasn't going to farm. Um, and I, you know, in farming, I, I maybe weirdly, I love the manual work. I loved feeding cattle. I hated driving tractor. I hated. I, I nothing was more painful to me than being put on a a five sixty. And I, again, I think I write about that. And you're pulling four fourteens, and which is what fifty six inches. Well, fourteen times four is what? Am I right? Fifty six inches. And and that's how much you're, you're this much. You're going all the way up to the end of the field, <laughs> you know, and then you're, then you're turning around and you're coming all the way back down at two or three miles an hour with this snorting thing. And I just, I just, my brother loved it. My older brother, he could drive tractor all, literally all day and all night. And he did. I mean, he'd go out there at night, plow all night. I just hate it. And so if I had been able to, uh, you know, see farming as working with the animals, as doing the physical labor, I might have been more inclined to go that way. But um, I just couldn't stand field work. And farming's field work. Oh, and now they're inviting tractors that you don't need drivers on them. So, so that's all changing too. Yeah. Do you feel like your your love of the work was something that you were fully aware of at that time, or is that something that you can appreciate? You know, I always liked. I always was aware that I liked physical labor. I was. I was as far back as I can remember, um, except for maybe when we started out feeding chickens. And I don't think I liked feeding chickens. I'm not terribly fond of chickens in general. Um, but once I once I moved to the, the work with the cattle, um, which is for us was really hard physical labor. We didn't have a silo and loader. We did all of it by pitchforks and silage forks. Um, we carried the you know these two bushel baskets of aluminum baskets up and down the bunks and dumped them. I mean it was it, you know loaded hay. I kind of loved it all. I don't know why, but and I was aware that, you know, other my brothers would be pissing and moaning about it, and I just kind of thought, well, this is all right. And I, I, I still love physical labor. I, I love, you know, I have a wood burning stove, and I, I love running a chainsaw. You know, <laughs> I hate, I hate everything about a chainsaw. Definitely using one. They're, they're just wonderful tools to use, and I. I love stacking wood. I love splitting wood. I split it all with a 16-pound maul. I, mean, I just love the, the doing it. Um, always have. Uh, and I can't, I can't get enough of it, frankly. I'm, I'm a, well, even when I, I'm, I'm kind of physically just engaged with the world that way. And so um, even when I write, I can only sit about 20 minutes. I've got to get up move around and, and then sit back down. and. Uh, and I've always got some kind of project going. I make bolts. Um, it's kind of my boomerangs have turned into bolts now. So I've made uh, two wood strip canoes and, and a st stitch and glue kayak and all the paddles for them. More paddles than they possibly need. 
and a shed to hold them in. Um, I make furniture. I've made a kitchen table. I've made a dresser. I've made a desk. I've made a glider rocker. All of this is just part of that. I want to use my hands in some form or another. Which is also, I think, something that we don't maybe recognize often enough in, uh, with our kids is how important contact with the world through the hands is and how much we learn that way. You know, we, we kind of have, I maybe sound like a curmudgeon, but I think that, that so much of our learning now is kind of abstract and, and clean. And um, we, don't, we don't manipulate the world. And, and part of what I like about writing is it's actually, writing may seem very clean and distant, but it's actually this manipulation of the world, you know, through your hands. You're, you're typing and, and the, the, the world gets changed on that screen or that piece of paper and then you feed it back into yourself and then you manipulate more. And so there's this really interesting recursive thing going on that is not that much different than uh, taking a rasp to a piece of plywood and watching an airfoil shape on it, which is all a boomerang is, is a double air flow. So you, you've got to watch that as you shape it and you learn that. Am I talking nonsense? Maybe I am. But, but I, I, I think that you know, learning is not, learning is not a head thing. It really is a, it's a physical thing. And, and the more we make it that way, I think the more, the more we learn, the deeper we learn. Or maybe that's just the way I learn. It may not be true for everybody. I just want to say something yeah. I appreciate in the essays, and you can expand on it if you want. But um, Southern Parks is the second class, and you know, there's a couple of guys at the auction. Oh, yeah. They're looking for their sheds and the feeding areas, and one says to the other, not much to it. Mm -hmm. which about the most powerful line in the book. Mm -hmm. It's so ironic given the <laughs> yeah, yes, and, yes. you know, two hundred pages. Yeah. And it's a certain vision, right? It's a certain way of seeing right. um, what you what we know as readers is uh, rich, deep and thoughtful and kind of what life is about before mm -hmm. and in a auction framework where it's just dollars and cents. Right. Not much to it. What I appreciate about that is how so much of the book is about the community in a positive way. Mm -hmm. The way they rally around, the way they support the family. And we think of that typically in small towns and farm communities where there's this positive right. kind of safety net, neighborhoods, um, supporting each other. Mm -hmm. Nonviolence comes to help, right? Right, right. But there's another side to yeah. it, and that's that it is dollars and cents. Yeah. And when one farm goes, the neighbor buys the land. Exactly. And I really appreciated that honesty. Thank you. I deal with the dark side of land in my fiction. You know, this very thing. I, I think there really are two sides. You know, for me, um, it was pretty fulfilling growing up on land. But for a lot of people, it is not. I mean, land can be a trap. Legacies, land or otherwise, can be real traps for people. And, um, you know, may you never inherit a legacy, people, because it's, it can really, you can really feel trapped. I think a lot of people do. And those are things I deal with in the fiction. Um, there's a real dark side. You know, there, there, there absolutely is. I agree with you entirely. Yeah. But for me, it really wasn't, you know, generally. But there was a lot of jealousy, you know. Harvest stores <laughs> are, are my big some of the kind of thing you're talking about, you know. If this neighbor put up a harvest store, then, then that guy did too. And the harvest store company made a huge amount of money on, on keeping up with the Joneses on farm. <laughs> they went broke, exactly. They went broke. They were a disaster. Yeah, they were a disaster. But they were they were a, a sexy symbol yeah. of of uh, doing well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
account. I love that comment. That's great. When did you start writing? Did you write as a teenager already? No. I was always interested in language. Um, I, I mean, I, that's, a, that's a hard question. Because I did write. But because I was supposed to, because I was told to. I mean, I, I participated in speech contests and the clam. I think it was called the clam back then, and wrote original essays um, when I was a teenager. But I never had any notion of being a writer. Uh, in fact, I went to college for chemistry and spent two years as a as a as a chemistry major, and then had a crisis of education and was going to drop out of school because I didn't know why I was doing it anymore, and and then took a bunch of gen ed courses. And um, one of them was a, a course in analyzing poetry. And I fell in love with analyzing poetry. The criticism, uh, the difficulty of it, the, the intellectual stimulus of analyzing poetry. And uh, all of my science friends thought I was copying out, of course, and taking the easy way out. And I couldn't convince them otherwise. Couldn't convince them that poetry, my god, could be difficult. A bunch of bullshit, and uh, but then I went on and got a master's degree in English. But still, I never, I've never taken a creative writing course. I just thought, uh, you know, I can't do that. I, I was, I was so convinced that good writers were. Now I really saw how good they were, and I just wasn't going to attempt it. Um, and then. Again, I told this story this morning, so if you were in that audience, forgive me, but then I went to a, the Great Plains Writers Workshop in Brookings the first year that I taught at Black Hill State University, and it's a regional conference where um, they, they bring in a national writer or two, but often a lot of just regional and local writers get up and read, and I was in the audience at one of these readings and listened to this first read, I kind of went, I can write that one. And so it, it turned at that point, where I had been, I can't possibly write like that. And then I went, well, I can write that well. And then formed a writing group with two other people who became very good friends of mine. And began to share writing once a week. We'd get together every Thursday night at a bar or restaurant and share writing. And that's when I started to write. And um, so I was in my mid-20s. But once I started, it, I just went whole hog. I mean, I, I turned my life over to it. Um, began to get up at 5 in the morning um, and write for the first three hours of the day, three to four hours of the day. Um, basically, from, from 5, I'd get up at 5, have coffee, and start writing about 5.30 or about 5.30, and I'd write till 9. And it was just, that's what I did. And I've been doing that for 38 years. You know. So once I started I was I was really serious about it. it. Took me five years to get a short story published. Um, that may be worth talking a bit about. I think that um, creative learning does not take place in, in a nice 45 degree angle, which is one of those myths that I think a lot of people absorb from the way we, the way a lot of classes work. You know, um, multiple choice tests probably influence the way we see learning. We see it as well. If we just if we learn this, then we can learn this, and we can learn this, and we can learn this. Um, but creative learning doesn't take place that way. Not it didn't for me. It doesn't among my students. You can be, I went five years, and every single thing I wrote was as bad as the one before it. It was complete garbage for five years trying to write fiction. I couldn't write fiction. And um, I just, you know, I don't know why I kept after it. Um, I really don't. But for five years, I wrote bad story after bad story after bad story. And then one day, literally in the space of three sentences, I learned to write fiction. And I could quote those three sentences for you because they're still in my head. But it, it was a it was a it was a thing where I, I sat down to write. I wrote these three sentences. I went, that's not me speaking. This is somebody I just invented a narrator. I don't know who this person is. 
And I finished that story in two weeks, and it was published the first place I sent it to. And from then on, I've been able to write fiction. So what's happening there? You know, it's it's something. Some learning was taking place clearly in five years, and then it's like the, the, the quantum mind goes boom. And just like that, I go through a vacuum, and I bend down here, and suddenly I'm writing literary fiction. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know that's, there's, talking about it is kind of spooky, frankly. Because I didn't go from writing poor fiction to good fiction. I went from writing something below poor fiction. You know, something that wasn't even, you couldn't even call it that. And then in three sentences, I was writing, again, not kind of good fiction. I was writing really good literary fiction. And nothing was, nothing between them. Nothing between them. There was no moderately good story between those two. Isn't that strange? But I've seen it happen in my students, too, where they'll be plugging away, and then they'll do this one thing. God, that so if you're teaching or if you're teaching or learning, and I hope all of you are, I think that's worth bearing in mind. That, you know, work work matters, and it does manifest. Um, it just might not manifest in ways that you expect or on the time frame you anticipate. How did you know those three sentences were something? Because I recognized that I was not speaking them. I came, the third sentence started out, here it is, I'll just tell you. I thought, I, was writing, I thought I was writing an essay about something that happened near my hometown. And I was going to write an essay about this, a, a, a factual nonfiction piece. And so I wrote this, um, although I, I made the name of um, just to, to protect identities, but so I wrote, Joseph Sullivan was 38 years old when he climbed under his combine to fix a broken sickle, leaving his three-year-old son in the cab. One sentence. The son got bored, started to play with the levers and pedals, and dropped the combine header onto his father's chest. Second. I imagine a sigh, huge and compressed, hydraulic oil moving through valves, perhaps a single creak of warning at the very instant of release, and then bones popping. When I heard that I, and then that list of I imagine a sigh, and all I'm doing as a writer at this point, people, is, is tracing ear, ear detail. I'm just hearing it. What are the sounds coming? But I realized it wasn't me doing that imagining. And when I realized that, that I wasn't me, I was like, oh, I'm writing fiction. Because that's what, that's what fiction is. Fiction is, is a story told by somebody other than the author. You invent a narrative. And that story just went. It just, but it got very different than the, the nonfiction piece I thought I was, I was writing. Something really big happened to me uh, artistically in that moment, where, where I, I suddenly understood how a, how a narrator works, how an author invents a narrator, how that invented narrator allows almost anything to happen. Um, it's a totally different animal than nonfiction. It works on different principles. Um, I'd been learning that for five years, and finally it just, it just worked. And I, I felt, oh, whoa. This is different. Yeah. What's your view on reading around in uh, kinds of things you like in your genre? So do you read other fiction about the subjects you're curious about, or are you more like I heard Philip Roth talk about just reading nonfiction because he's not interested in anybody else's style. <laughs> um, you know, he's got his own voice in his head. Where do you come down on that? On the other? Um, I read. I do like reading nonfiction just because I like learning things. And I think that nonfiction feeds fiction writers because they just know more. 
But I do also read a lot of fiction, and I read very broadly and very... Um, I try to read the best stuff out there. The most recent novel I've read was George Saunders' Lincoln in the Bargo. There's nothing to do with the Midwest or with anything I, I work with, but it's just plain good writing and imaginative writing at a very high level. And so um, I, I read a fair amount also of international fiction. I'm, I'm interested in um, writers from different... I taught a course, in fact, in, in uh, uh, non-Western novel when I was teaching at Black Hill State University. And that part is my personal interest in reading out of my own culture. So, um, but I think it's also important to kind of know what, you know, what, you're, what the writers who are similar to you are doing too. So I'm kind of giving you a non-answer and giving you an answer that says, oh, just everything. I just, I just read... Quality is what I'm interested in. If it's good work, I want to, I, I, I will read it. You know. Right now, though, I have to tell you, tell you that I just read an awful lot of manuscripts. I, I, you reach a stage in your life as a writer where you become well enough known and you become connected enough to other, to other apprentice writers. That, um, like right now, I've got two manuscripts, one to blurb and one to critique. You know, one from a fellow writer, Mary Claremont Blue, who many of you might know of. Um, I'm blurbing her, no her new novel coming out in next year, and then I've got a manuscript from a former student that I've agreed to read. So um, I do just a, a lot of that kind of reading, which kind of bugs me sometimes because it keeps me away from what I just like to read. But it's also, I think, part of what you give back to a, a community. You know? So. This, I'm, not, I'm not inviting any of you to give me a manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm curious if you think of yourself as an poet, because when I've been teaching parts of this to my creative writing class, I find myself pulling out the poetic elements mm. in your essays, the repetition, the alliteration, uh, just mm. those, the strong imagery um, as examples of what they should be striving mm. for in their poetry. Okay, that's great. I love that, but I don't think of myself as a poet. No, I don't. I I I, 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 I like. I'm, I'm glad that you do. Um, you know, the, when I used to try to write poetry, it always turned into fiction. It always turned into narratives, and of course, there is narrative poetry. Um, but in, in, in that sense, I could I could see it. But the, the lyric moment, you know, lyric poetry. I can't write. I just can't capture that lyric moment. And um, friends of mine who were poets, I just admire that. You know, and writers, we're always jealous of what other writers can do. We all, if you've been in an artistic community, you're probably aware of that. That you think because what well, because what you, what you do, you think well, it has to be easy because you can do it. And then you look at somebody else who does something you can't do, and you think, oh my god, that person's a genius, because they can do this thing that I can't do. And I cannot do lyric poetry. And so I admire lyric poetry, poets immensely. I just think, wow, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I found that when I was teaching this class, that I found myself really connecting with just snippets. Just, uh -huh. you, you'd have you know, a paragraph, and it just, that's great. I, it just captures a feeling that is hard to put into words. That's great. I love it. I have one spot, and then you're looking for me, but I yeah. responded to that, and I just came in. Sorry. I have one little bookmark place in the book, one little tab that I needed to go back to because that one spoke to me. And it was one of the first ones that you brought up. And me as an artist, I understand perspective. I get that. Mm -hmm. But when you put into words how the prairie is straight line and the mountains are vertical, that just clicked. Mm -hmm. So I think there was a lot, and this is just a statement, not really a question. There were those passages that just, I need to go back. I need to think any more of that. Mm -hmm. Neat. I won't even comment on that. I'm going to put that stand. Yeah. <laughs> Do your siblings agree with your recounting events? You know, for the most part, my, my older brother does not remember running into that snowdrift. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't remember that. So we don't agree on everything. 
Um, but for the most part, my, my family responded to this book very positively. Yeah. Um, it's the kind of book I suppose that could create dissension, but it, it didn't. I mean, my siblings read it and they talked about it and they appreciated it, and, and except for that, that's the only instance I can say where I had, I had someone say, no, I don't think it happened that way. And maybe it did. Maybe I made it that up. But uh, I, I do remember. He just doesn't. Anything else? Um, you kind of talked about this earlier, but the, the chapter about your mother Candy, mm -hmm. um, or no, sorry, not that one. Um, the one, I think it's that Cameron Hill. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. About, yeah. Um, you know, how your dad wanted you to know Candy. Right, right, right. right. Um, I'm curious how, I mean, you talked about a lot of your physical activities, but just how you, you know, totally different lifestyle. It, my kids did a lot of just spending time on their own, just running around. Um, they had a lot of free time. I mean, we did the typical soccer stuff, and I heard them absolutely adore soccer, um, and a lot of structured stuff. But, but my children also just a lot of time where they just weren't told what to do and weren't um, encouraged, you know, I, who was I talking about this earlier, you know, if, if my kids came to me and said, I'm bored, my response was, congratulations, good for you, do something about it. Because I do think boredom is one of the uh, impetuses towards creativity. And almost every time I said something like that to one of my kids, 10 minutes later, they'd be doing some kind of creative play. They would invent something to do. Um, so I didn't, I didn't say, oh, you're bored. Oh, I feel so sorry for you. You know, let me turn the TV on for you, or, or let me find something for you to do. Um, what, what a writer does, or an artist, uh, essentially is, at the most basic level, you put yourself into a state of extreme boredom. You know, in my case, I go in and I sit down in front of a computer screen, and I've got the end of a sentence before. There's nothing there. If I don't fill it, if I don't create the next thing, I'm really, really bored. I mean, this is what I do with my life. And I suspect the same is true for painting, isn't it? You, you go in and you've got this sheet of canvas before you. And you have to make something happen on it. You know, so that I think I think boredom is part of of creative activity. Um, and so I didn't ever want to encourage my children to think that boredom was a disease that had to be um, cured through some through somebody else's activity. You know, you have to deal with it. Um, I think I'm still answering your question. I'm not sure I am, but I think I am. Um, and, and I don't think that it takes a farmstead to, to be a creative place for a child to live in. You know, you, you could, a backyard can be that place. If you, if you give kids opportunity to utilize it in creative ways, I think all of that, all of that is kind of is part of my parenting philosophy. They didn't have an iron pile and a wood pile and a welder and a grinder, but they had enough similar stuff that they could make that happen. And in fact, my older son is incredibly adept with tools and making stuff and uh, overhauling cars. And my younger son is a ceramic artist, you know, so they've, uh, they absorb some. And my, and my daughter is an astonishing maker of children's costumes and uh, those sorts of things. So they clearly absorb something from all, all three of them. Yeah. And birthday cakes, too. She makes incredible birthday cakes. 
to delight her children and, her, and their grandparents. Nice question, but it, it, it's a little hard, I think. Yeah, and I grew up on a farm, similar makeup to yours, not the same mm -hmm. size and era, but that's part of why I ask. I, I don't do physical things when I get a job or not, but I have a small daughter, so it's kind of like, oh. I, I get what is lost in that right. transition of kids being able to be with their parents, keeping their jobs. Right, right, and right. So that part of the equation, I think, is very hard. I, you know, um, I think that's a hard one, and I don't know. I did not take my own kids to work with me, obviously. You know, you can't have a kid in a college classroom. So that that part of it's really hard. You can't you can't have a kid help you read freshman composition papers. You know, it just doesn't work. And that's a hard one, and I don't know. I, but there's no solution to it. Anything else? What I like really, I guess, just coming back to this, I like the questions being raised. I, I, I think it's cool that the book raises these, these questions. You know, I'm sitting up here trying to come up with answers, but probably I shouldn't try to be answered. I should just say, that's a really, really good question. <laughs> you know, go deal with it. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you asked it, you know. But I think it's one of the contemporary worlds. Well, we all live in worlds. We all live in contemporary worlds that have their own particular issues. And that, I think, is one of them for, for our world. Yeah. Anything else that you want to ask or say? How about you? Okay. And uh, Holly's got an announcement about next year's book. Okay, yeah. I, before I do that, I will. I should say, out of the, um, I, be, I brought books, some of them. So I've got I've got some copies of the Witness Accounts. If you haven't read it, and want to read it, and I've got some copies of uh, the River Warren and of uh, which is a Minnesota book, a Minnesota novel, and uh, Twisted Tree, which is a South Dakota book, a gruesome book. It starts out with a mass murderer, but but once you get past the first chapter, I think you you, you can live with. But people tell me they're just creeped out by the first chapter. I'm warning you of that one. Um, so I've, I've got I've got those things out there if you want to buy them. Okay. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce next year's book. We're excited to draw people back and say what's coming in year four. I only have four slips and I have six books. So if you want to shout your name at me quick, you may have a pretty good chance of winning next year's book. Anybody want to add a name? Fires. I got those two. So our next book is Adam Kleiner. The Life We Bury by Alan Eskins. The Life We Bury tells the story of Joe Talbert, a junior at the University of Minnesota who receives a class assignment to write a biography of someone who has lived an interesting life. At a nursing home, he meets Carl Iverson, a man dying of cancer, who has been medically paroled after spending 30 years in prison for the murder of a 14-year-old girl. Carl agrees to tell Joe his story, and Joe sets out to unravel the tapestry of the 30-year-old murder. Alan Eskins will be joining us next year in about the November time period for the fourth year of One Books, One Sioux County, so we look forward to seeing you there. So, we have six books to pass out to celebrate that announcement. And I heard a couple extra names come out, so I will share those with you. Your name is shared. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll pass out the rest. <laughs> we'll look forward to seeing you next year. You know where to find us. You can come and ask questions. Yes. And then, behalf of, on behalf of One Book, Winsu County, thank you for coming up. Thank you for braving the weather. Thank you for being here. Um, and eat extra desserts. <laughs> and we have desserts in our reception area. Please eat a few, bring them home. Um, and thank you for coming.